I've always identified myself being a NUC. I just didn't have that understanding as a kid, like what that actually meant. Marissa St. Goddard has a foot in two worlds. Born to an Inuk mother, adopted by a non-Indigenous couple, she was raised just outside Winnipeg. I was adopted at nine months old. It was something that I really struggled with, I guess, throughout life. It was mainly that sense of belonging that I couldn't really get a handle on. Then she came here. Kamayuk is the Winnipeg Art Gallery's new centre for Inuit art and culture. Honestly, ever since working at the art gallery, that's when it really started to really feel connected. Her passion is art. Ever since she was a kid, nothing was off limits to her. Crayons, pencils, markers, everything has been a canvas. It was always something that just brought me a lot of joy. And the gallery is taking her to a whole new level. She guides tour groups, mostly young people, through Inuit exhibits and the work of other Indigenous artists. And what are we going into? Robert Hewell today. Mm -hmm. The best part about like teaching young kids about my culture is just something that really, it does a little something in here. And I'm just, mm. it's so cool to see that this next generation of kids that are just so open about learning about it. When you say it does a little something in here, what, what do you mean? It just kind of like brightens my soul a little bit, I'd say. When I'm in the moment doing it, I just, everything feels lighter. In fact, Kamayuk means it is bright, it is lit in Inuktitut. The gallery opened in early 2021 in downtown Winnipeg. It is the world's largest public collection of contemporary Inuit art. The centerpiece is what's called the Visible Vault, curated by Darlene Coward-White. There's 4,500 pieces in here, and all of these are stone because of the environmental conditions here. It's three stories of Inuit art, two above ground and one below. Our whalebone, our ivory and our antler is down below. There are pieces from 25 communities here spanning generations. Art that was once safely stored out of public view is now the first thing visitors see when they walk in. We really wanted to be able to show the world that here they are. You don't have to pay a fee to see our visible vault. We have um, the communities all on display here. We really wanted to make it more accessible. That was the big thing. Darlene has researched and curated Inuit art for close to 40 years. The more that people know about other cultures, I think the more opportunities we have for mutual understanding and empathy. We are trying to bridge that gap to help people understand and to see it here. Right from the start, the gallery worked with Inuit elders, community members and knowledge keepers in every step of the process. Kamayuk is reimagining the relationship with Inuit artists and communities. We're very interested in the transparency and the communication in the inclusiveness of what we're doing. We're trying very hard to get beyond a colonial attitude towards art. Inuit and their ancestors have been skilled artists and carvers for thousands of years. What we know as contemporary Inuit art began in 1949, around the time when artist James Houston organized an exhibition with pieces he bought during trips to the North. The exhibition was popular with collectors and the federal government, which was looking for ways to get the North on a wage economy. It wanted Inuit communities to make art for money accelerating a shift away from traditional ways of life. Art was sold and shipped to market through the Hudson's Bay Company and later through community-owned co-ops. A number of regions flourished and they remain hubs for internationally renowned Inuit artists, but many others struggled. Conversations about the ethics of colonial art systems like this are happening in galleries across the country. I'm Ganyangahaga also known as Mohawk of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. My home community is the Six Nations of the Grand River, but I now have the honor and privilege of living and working on unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. Last year, the National Gallery in Ottawa launched the Department of Indigenous Ways and Decolonization. Stephen Loft is the Vice President. For the first time in this institution's 80-year history, you have not one, but two 
indigenous people at the highest level of decision making. Institutions don't change themselves. People change institutions. That means embedding indigenous voices and expertise in all aspects of the National Gallery. There's an indigenous art history of this land. There's indigenous art histories from other lands. We're starting to understand the plurality of cultural expression and getting away from this notion of a dominance of one kind. Stephen wants the National Gallery to be a global leader in that new way of understanding indigenous art, though he admits not everyone is on board. You're always going to get that pushback because it is about power and privilege. And institutions like this are built on power and privilege. We have to reconcile with that history as well. But we have to move forward. And by moving forward, we commit to a much more, not just inclusive, but equitable understanding of culture. And I think that's exciting work. 30 years ago, we didn't have the, the language to really uh, think about what decolonizing a space would mean. And uh, I think now there's a lot more dialogue with Indigenous, non-Indigenous folks that challenge sort of those, those hierarchies or those uh, very oppressive structures that are quite harmful. Glenn Gear is a multidisciplinary artist and filmmaker living in Montreal. I'm originally from Cornerbrook, Newfoundland, and I come from Inuit and settler ancestry. My father is Inuk from a place called Alatuk Bay in Labrador, near Natsialvut, and my mother is Newfoundlander with Irish and English background. Glenn calls himself an urban Inuk, and like many artists of his generation, his work is a reflection of his past and present. It's video art, it's performance, it's textiles, it's based in so many different mediums. It's, you know, painting and drawing. It's not just the prints and uh, sculptures of, of yesteryear. I mean, it continues to be that, but it's so much more. This is uh, one of the collages that I did from some of the photo archives in Labrador. Glenn was commissioned to create a piece for Kamoyuk's opening. The installation is called Iluani Silami. It's full of stars. It's very much a, a space of reflection, but also it's a love letter to Labrador in a container. It's my dad. His dad is his connection to the land and to culture in Labrador, the focus of the Inuit stories he explores through his art. A lot of the titles of my works are in Inutitut from my region. That's important for me to kind of reclaim that language because it was very broken with my father, him being a child of the residential school system. He didn't have Inutitut as his language, even though his mother, my grandmother, uh, spoke it fluently. When I started to dive into my father's history, which, you know, I share that history with him, I began to understand maybe some of the cultural breaks that were there and the ways that he couldn't speak about his culture or his connection to Inuit culture. That look into his own history is painstaking but rewarding. Part of my work is an act of repair and remediation of th that whole process of, of trying to reconnect, trying to understand the language and learn it uh, one word at a time. There's joy with, within that process of struggling through language and struggling through culture and making those connections. In Winnipeg, Marissa is going through that process too. I think this one was like my favorite though. This one I remember. I always loved like the art style in this book too. My mom would always read me like these Inuit books that she would buy all based around Inuit art and Inuit people. I was like, oh, like I kind of look like these people. And in, in a way, it sort of gave me a sense of belonging. She has formed relationships with some of her Inuit relatives and learned more about their history. That, combined with her art, is helping her create a narrative about who she is. These are most of the artworks that I've done throughout high school. Art, in general, is, I think, like a therapy. Whether if it's to get your mind off of things or expressing yourself with how you're feeling. I was painting that one and, at the time, my headspace was in a 
point of healing, it was a point of growth, uh, finding new perspectives of everything like based on life. And the piece right beside it, like the woman here, she represents to me just like that sense of like self, um, accepting like who you are as a person. I'm just really excited to be here today to show you guys some art. Marissa is helping kids discover their own voice through art. I'm just kind of taking the brush and um, doing like these back and forth, up and down kind of movements to give it that streaky look so that it kind of looks like the northern lights. Nice. Together with a colleague, she's teaching a virtual art class to kids in remote Arctic communities. I think it's super powerful to learn about who you are as a person, but then share it with others at the same time. As Marissa and other young Inuit artists create a new path for themselves, the gallery is showcasing what's possible for the future. I think things have really shifted right now with the way that galleries think about how they engage different communities, indigenous communities, how they engage uh, curators, and how they are more open to hearing what new voices are emerging, and especially what youth have to say and how they engage in those gallery spaces. It's a really exciting time for Inuit art and Inuit artists. Art is definitely something that I do see in my future. I don't mm. know what I'm going to do with it, but mm. we'll see what the universe has lined up.